She returned to Japan this summer to investigate the effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster on Hiroshima's peace movement. Mary also works with many nuclear non-proliferation groups in Boston, such as Global Zero and the American Friends Service Committee. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm Mary, and it's a pleasure for me to be here speaking with all of you today, especially about a topic as close to my heart as uh, Japanese peace culture. I'm here today to tell you all a tale of two cities, if you will. Both have been affected by uh, nuclear catastrophe. Both continue to experience the after effects of uh, nuclear radiation. And both have developed under highly different circumstances. So to begin, um, on August 6th, 1945, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, as you can see here. And 45,000 people died in an instant. 45,000. Tens of thousands more died in the aftermath. And although the bomb victims, or hibakusha, as they're called in Japan, suffered such an enormous tragedy at the hands of Americans, they don't harbor hatred, they don't seek revenge. Instead, they have transformed Hiroshima into an international model for a city for peace. On March 11th, 2011, a massive uh, tsunami ravaged the east coast of Japan, causing a nuclear meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, as you can see right here. This event was a seven out of seven on the international nuclear event scale and was the largest uh, nuclear catastrophe to occur since Chernobyl in 1966. And to this day, it continues to contaminate our soil, our water, and our air with uh, radioactive materials. So these are the two cities I'm going to be talking to you uh, about today. And when I first arrived at Boston College, I didn't have the first clue about nuclear issues. Um, it wasn't until I traveled to Nagasaki a few summers ago that I was first exposed to the horrors of the atomic bomb. And I uh, attended this peace ceremony, as you can see right up here. And at the peace ceremony, a man stood at a podium and announced the names of the people who had died that year, 2012, from a bomb that had been dropped in 1945. So although I learned about the atomic bombings in school and in classes, I was really shocked by the longevity of the after effects. And I returned to Boston College determined to learn more. Uh, the following January, uh, the Japanese uh, Roman Catholic bishops came out with a statement calling for an end to nuclear energy use. This really shocked me, um, not only because nuclear energy is a very contentious issue, as Boris mentioned earlier, but also because in order for the Japanese bishops to issue such a proclamation, all 16 of them have to be in unanimous agreement. Um, so as a Catholic myself, I had realized I'd never really thought about the ramifications of nuclear energy. And um, looking back to my experience in Nagasaki, my brain began to ask questions and then make connections. I wondered, what are the connections between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, between Hiroshima and Fukushima? And more importantly, were Japanese people making these connections? Um, so I, I, the more that these questions accumulated in my head, I became determined to visit Hiroshima, which is pictured here, um, where I felt certain that I would find some answers. Hiroshima's peace culture has always been at the forefront of dialogue on nuclear weapons and human rights. And so this summer, with funding from the Boston College Center for Human Rights and International Justice, I conducted a two-month uh, research trip in Hiroshima to study the effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster on Hiroshima's peace culture. Um, I expected that Hiroshima would have adopted an anti-nuclear energy stance in addition to their anti-nuclear weapons stance, figuring that um, the Fukushima nuclear disaster should uh, challenge Hiroshima's NGOs, uh, civil society, and local government to maybe uh, rethink their missions and broaden their definition of nuclear disarmament. So what exactly did I do in Hiroshima? To begin, I worked at the World Friendship Center, which is a nonprofit anti-nuclear organization, anti-nuclear weapons organization, um, founded by an American Quaker. So I got the NGO side of the story. Uh, I also attended several conferences where I uh, rubbed elbows with uh, government officials and leaders. Um, for example, I heard from the president of the UN General Assembly, from the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, and from Hiroshima's mayor and governor. 
So I heard from government officials. And finally, to get uh, the perspective of the normal average citizens in Hiroshima, I conducted over 30 interviews with people from all sorts of different backgrounds, you name it, uh, students, professors, religious, hibakusha, uh, Fukushima evacuees, scientists, reporters, I interviewed them all. And I asked them if they uh, thought Hiroshima had changed uh, after Fukushima, and if they saw a connection between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Um, so I got their perspective as well. Uh, so, what I learned from the community in Hiroshima really opened my eyes to the complexity of the nuclear issue. Um, nuclear energy was first introduced to Japan uh, in the 1950s by President Eisenhower, who was launching his Atoms for Peace campaign. And this campaign promoted nuclear energy as a cheap, green, uh, safe energy source. And by the 1970s, with the oil crisis, the Japanese government was solidly on board. Um, but these two governments realized that it would take something pretty special to convince the Japanese to support anything nuclear after what they had been through with the atomic bombings. So they decided that the most powerful propaganda tool would be to get the hibakusha from Hiroshima and Nagasaki on board. So because of this, one of the very first exhibits to be displayed in the Hiroshima Memorial Peace Museum, right here, was an exhibit about nuclear energy, um, advertising it as this miraculous uh, solution to energy security. And it was even proposed that the first nuclear reactor be built in Hiroshima. And so although it is true that nuclear energy does have many benefits um, and, and does create a lot of energy, uh, what the people of Japan and of Hiroshima weren't being told at the time was that like all energy sources, uh, nuclear energy is far from perfect. Um, the creation of nuclear energy takes a lot um, high subsidies, high construction costs. Um, although nuclear energy production itself doesn't uh, emit any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the refining, mining, and transport of uranium, which is the fuel for these power plants, uses a lot of fossil fuels. Um, in addition, nuclear power plants produce nuclear waste, uh, which remains dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. And on top of all that, we have no idea where to put it. We have not found a way of safely storing this waste. And for this reason, one of my, the people that I interviewed compared nuclear reactors to houses with no toilets because we have no idea where to put the waste. Um, in addition to this, hum, uh, nuclear power plants can be a human rights issue as well. While I was in Hiroshima, I attended a lecture by Peter Watts, who is an Aboriginal man from Australia, and he explained that the majority of the world's uranium resources lie under lands owned by Aboriginal or uh, tribal groups. And because of the uranium mining industry, these groups have been displaced, and there have been enormous environmental damages in places like India and Australia. In the case of Fukushima, which is a poor prefecture in Japan with little industry and pretty much no economic power, they are subjected to the detriments of the nuclear power plants while all the energy that's produced there is actually shipped off to Tokyo. And the way that the government convinces places like Fukushima to accept power plants is they offer to inject money for infrastructure into the economy, but this money only lasts for five years. And so when the five years is up, the poor regions have built infrastructure but have no way to maintain it except to accept more power plants. So for this reason, there's a vicious cycle where power plants are in clusters in um, disadvantaged areas. So when I was talking to Fukushima evacuees in Hiroshima, this really opened my eyes to the challenges that they face today. Half, over half of the 300,000 Fukushima evacuees are still in temporary housing with no hope of returning home anytime soon. Families have been split apart. Um, mothers want to bring their children to safer areas while fathers have to stay in uh, Fukushima to work. Or in most circumstances, families don't have the financial resources to relocate at all. And these people live with enormous phobia of radiation. Um, most Japanese, uh, I guess, dry their clothing and futons outside. Fukushima people don't do that. They are afraid to walk in the rain. A lot of couples are afraid to have children. Um, and for those families who do relocate, their children are often bullied at school because others are afraid that radiation is contagious. Single adults uh, have trouble finding marriage partners and are subjected to social uh, stigmatization. So scientists have predicted that because of this, in the next couple of years, we're going to see a rise in Fukushima 
in uh, mental health disorders, suicide, depression, and alcohol abuse. Um, as for the physical effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, that has yet to be seen. The World Health Organization this year published a report that said that the uh, physical effects would most likely be negligible. They cited a 1% increase in the rate of cancer in infants. However, if we're looking back to the experience of Chernobyl, it will take another three to five years for the uh, symptoms to expose themselves. Um, so how did the people of Hiroshima react to the Fukushima nuclear disaster? At first, they were outraged. As you can see here, um, tons of hibakusha and peace groups mobilized to send donations, to equip relief centers, to volunteer, and to organize these huge rallies. Um, people all over Japan started to save energy. When I was in Japan, it was one of the hottest summers on record, and my host mom refused to use air conditioning. So because of this public outcry, all the nuclear reactors in Japan remain shut down. However, despite this initial fervor, um, in the interactions that I had with Hiroshima dwellers, I found that you know, it's been almost three years since the disaster, and people are starting to forget. Um, my trip to Hiroshima corresponded with an upper house election in which Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's representatives were overwhelmingly elected, even in Hiroshima. And Shinzo Abe is a staunch right winger. Um, he supports the remilitarization of Japan, the revision of Article 9 in the Constitution, and the reactivation of the power plants. Um, and actually, his representatives have stated that uh, the plutonium produced from these plants actually could and should be used to make nuclear weapons, should Japan ever feel the need. Um, I have a feeling that the economy had a big reason, was a big reason why people voted for him, because it has been growing um, since he came into office. However, I think that if Hiroshima could band together and, um, and oh, this is a picture of Shinzo Abe. If, if Hiroshima could band together uh, to unite against the government's aggressive policies, there would definitely be ripples. Um, although Hiroshima is called the city of peace, it's surrounded by American military bases. The hibakusha are getting older, and what used to be a thriving peace education curriculum has now been reduced to maybe a day memorial service in most schools. So by failing to look at the nuclear industry as a whole, by failing to identify with other victims of uh, war or discrimination, um, I think that Hiroshima has a rather myopic view of what peace culture is. Um, and by supporting Abe administration, by um, per perpetuating this narrow peace culture, um, Hiroshima's message of, of peace and forgiveness is not reaching its full potential. I worry that Hiroshima is becoming history, that its relevancy as an international city for peace is at stake. So today, the Fukushima nuclear disaster is far from over. As you can see here, it was reported in July that over 300 tons uh, of radioactive water is leaking into the Pacific Ocean every day. Um, but the most immediate threat at Fukushima right now are these 13,000 spent nuclear fuel rods on top of, sorry here, on top of Unit 4. Um, and Unit 4 is a very unstable building since the earthquake. If it collapsed, it would create, cause a fire that would generate the equivalent of 14,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. Wow. Um, and the government has predicted that cleanup will take about 40 years and has promised about $500 million to build this enormous uh, underground ice wall to contain groundwater flows. But this technology has never been tried. No one knows if it will work. Um, so it's a little bit shaky there. So this Monday, actually, TEPCO, which is the company that owns the Fukushima nuclear power plant, began this project to remove the nuclear fuel rods from on top of Unit 4. And petitions have poured in from all over the world um, by people urging the UN to allow an international team of scientists, experts, engineers in to take over because TEPCO and the Japanese government have shown that they lack the resources and the expertise to correctly handle the situation. So, all these petitions show that Fukushima is an international crisis. And it requires an international solution, especially now that Japan has been pegged as the location for the 2020 Olympic Games. I think as Boston College students, it is crucial that we're aware of this impending international disaster that has the possibility to radically alter uh, the reality of the world that we live in. And um, the 
environmental and psychological and, and possibly even physical ramifications of this event will affect our generation much more than it will affect the people actually making these decisions about nuclear energy. So in closing, um, I think it's important to note that Hiroshima is not Fukushima. Nuclear energy is not nuclear weapons. Um, nuclear weapons only have the ability to destroy and kill, while nuclear energy does have benefits. Um, it may be possible that Japan has to continue to rely on its nuclear generators until greener alternatives can be developed. However, I think it's also very important to note that nuclear energy is not the ultimate solution. Um, like nuclear weapons, it produces um, nuclear waste or nuclear radiation that is slowly poisoning our planet. And in a world increasingly threatened by the dangers of the nuclear industry, um, Hiroshima's message has to be reinvigorated. It has to be connected to issues outside of just nuclear weapons. Because peace is more than just the absence of war. And I think that if Hiroshima could broaden its idea of what peace culture is, it could be a voice for the international peace movement, it could support Fukushima evacuees and victims, and it could lead our world towards a future of stability and peace. Thank you.